So firstly, who am I? Um, as I said, I joined the society relatively recently um, and I'm one of the lecturers in conservation science. Um, so I do a lot of teaching, but I'm also the co-lead of our Cordofan draft project in Northern Cameroon. Um, so that's working with uh, Dr. Caspian Johnson, who I think has given a talk um, to this lecture series before, uh, mostly managing sort of um, large threatened mammal species. So in terms of my background, um, did my PhD at Brighton, um, but my master's and BSc were actually here in Bristol. Um, so I kind of consider myself a, a quite a broad research scientist, a wildlife ecologist really. Um, I've done previous work on amphibians, on gibbons, um, and most recently rhinos. Um, but all of my recent work um, and sort of current work here at the zoo is focused on Cameroonian wildlife um, with our flagship species, draft. So I really wanted to talk to you about draft today. Um, we had a big plan to go out in December to um, conduct some of our sort of conservation workshops, to run some training workshops, to do some wildlife monitoring. Um, but what with the pandemic, it got cancelled, I think for the third time for that trip. So I'm not going to talk about draft today. And instead, I'm going to talk about some of my previous research um, on white rhinoceros, which I did before I joined the zoo. So um, that's, that's basically why I'm not talking about our current conservation work and why I'm talking about um, an interest, um, or I guess uh, a, a topic that I um, spent quite a few years studying. Um, it's the topic I did my PhD on, which is white rhino conservation. So um, with that all out the way, we will get started. Just check the chat. Excellent. I can see that I can be heard. Glad I'm not just talking into the abyss. It's definitely happened before. Um, cool. In that case, let's get started. So what I'm going to cover today is a very broad overview about the historical status, I guess, of white rhinos, um, where they're at today in terms of their conservation status, um, how that ties in with some of my own research um, and on sort of both current and historic conservation actions that are being taken uh, to save them. So over the last three centuries or so, all five rhino species have seen their ranges contract and their populations decline. Um, it's a mix of several things, um, hunting being the primary one, a bit of habitat loss, and also some population fragmentation where rhinos are getting separated out into smaller and smaller populations and simply not meeting each other uh, to breed uh, and sort of maintain um, a healthy gene pool. So um, it's, uh, a, it's a group of species, um, the rhinocerids, that are found in both Africa and Asia. Um, and every single one of those five species um, has declined over the last few centuries to varying degrees, um, but broadly all due to the same factors. So the major historical pattern has essentially been for hunters to deplete one population and then move on to another. So slowly but steadily, um, they've been uh, extirpated or locally extinct um, across their range. Um, and it's sort of gradually restricted uh, and constrained where rhinos are found to fewer and fewer places. So that's been perhaps most um, uniform and, and most complete with the Asian species that are now only found in just a few small pockets. Um, the two African species still occur in a, a bit of a wider area, but even so, they are nowhere near um, ranging across the habitats that they're used to. So just a little bit of background before I get on to white rhinos, which is of course the focus of this talk. Um, the five species that we've heard of potentially or not are the Indian rhino. Um, so this is also known as the greater one-horned rhino. So it's got a single horn, so quite an obvious name there. Um, there's about 3,600 individuals. Um, and this is pretty much a conservation success story. Um, back in about 1900, there was probably only about 120 or so individuals. So they really have increased, um, but there's still lots of threats and issues that I won't be talking about today, but um, are something that you can perhaps look up if you're interested. Um, less uh, perhaps positive is the situation for the Sumatran rhino. So there's only about 80 individuals or fewer um, thought to be alive 
um, they're all constrained um, or restricted to um, a small sort of several small subpopulations in um, Borneo um, and a couple, I believe, in Sumatra too. Uh, but there really is very few of those around um, and they are very much on the pathway to extinction. Javan rhino, pretty much a similar status to the Sumatran rhino, um, except they're all found in a single location on the island of Java in Southeast Asia. Um, what makes it even worse is that they're right next to Krakatoa, the huge volcano that could erupt at any moment. So as well as having all of those threats due to sort of habitat loss and a, and a small population size, they could get wiped out from sort of a single natural disaster that could really happen at any time. Um, so they are critically endangered, much like the Sumatran rhino. Um, the black rhino is one of the two African species. Um, it's about 5,600 of them. Um, and a bit like the white rhino, they've had sort of ups and downs in terms of their conservation over the last few decades. So the one I'm going to be focusing on is the white rhino. Um, they are near threatened, which means that there is uh, the potential for them to decline. Um, and there's a much healthier 18,000 of those. So you might think, well, surely conservation of the white rhino isn't an issue. It's perhaps not a problem. Um, but I'll be telling you about why that's not the case um, over the next few slides. So, First of all, a little bit of background um, to sort of give you some information about the white rhino. Um, it's the world's second largest terrestrial mammal. Um, so that's counting all elephant species, I guess, as a single mammal, perhaps wrong there. Um, but it's, it's huge. Um, they are potentially the largest grazer that's ever lived. So a grazer being an animal that eats grass, something like an elephant, of course, also eats leaves and things like that. Um, so they're rather large. Um, they weigh about two tons, um, with the males being slightly larger than the females. Um, and as I said, they are grazers. Um, they like specific types of grass, and they are found across your sort of standard savanna landscapes of Africa. Um, and they eat a lot of grass, about 2% of their body mass per day. So that would work out as about, what, 40 kilograms of grass per day, which is quite a lot of grass. So you'll see this spray bandied about, people like to call pretty much anything a keystone species. Um, what that means essentially is that they've got a big impact on their ecosystems, um, but in the case of the rhino, it is quite true. Um, so because they eat so much grass, they create what are known as sort of short grass grazing lawns in African savannas. So they munch the grass down to a sort of really low height, um, much more than is capable than other uh, grazing species. Um, so these lawns have this quite interesting property where they can actually act as fire breaks when sort of natural fires break out in the bush. Um, and what that does is it means that the sizes of those fires that break out are sort of smaller and more patchy. So it promotes a sort of um, mosaic of habitat types, which is, of course, really good for species diversity. So because of that, they've actually been called landscape architects. Um, so they're not only interesting and sort of fascinating animals. They also have a really um, important impact on their ecosystems too. So you've potentially heard of the fact that there is a northern white rhino and a southern white rhino. So these two lineages of rhino or two subspecies are estimated to have diverged about 80,000 years ago. And in terms of how they look, um, their morphology is actually quite similar. If you had uh, a northern white rhino in a zoo next to a southern white rhino, you probably couldn't notice the differences between them. However, if you delve a little bit further into their anatomy, there are some sort of um, cranial differences, so skull differences, difference in teeth. Um, and then the last thing that's potentially different too is their behavior. So, as I'll tell you in a second, there's not that many northern white rhinos left at all, um, and therefore it's quite difficult to actually sort of identify what those characteristics might be. Um, but they are distinct um, and they can be separated. Um, and recently there was actually um, an academic push by some uh, researchers to get the northern white rhino recognised as its own species. They wanted to call it the Nile rhinoceros. Um, Weighing up the genetic evidence, though, it was decided it would make more sense um, to keep them separated 
as one species, but split into sort of two separate subspecies. So in terms of where they're found, um, the northern whites, uh, believe it or not, are north of the southern ones. Um, throughout recorded history, they've been separated by about 2,000 kilometers. So the southern white roams sort of between the Cape, the southernmost point of South Africa, up to the Zambezi. And you've kind of got an expanse of East Africa and the Congo, and then the northern whites were found in sort of wetter savanna habitats across places like South Sudan um, and the Democratic Republic of Congo. So a few other points on rhino before we start to delve into some of the sort of conservation issues um, that apply here. Um, the thing to, I guess, be most aware of in rhinos is that they have rather large horns, um, about six kilograms worth of horn in a male and about five kilograms worth of horn um, in a female. And of course, they've got two horns. They've got a larger posterior horn, um, anterior horn even, and a slightly smaller one um, further back on their skull. So these horns are made entirely of keratin. Um, so keratin is a type of protein. Um, and that means it's different to the types of horns we see in other species. So in something like um, bovidae, so that's cows, that sort of stuff, buffalo, um, they've got a mix of keratin and bone horns, so it's usually attached to the skull. Um, and in the cervidae, that's the deer, they of course have solid bone horns. Um, so it's a, it's a very different structure um, evolutionarily in terms of what, what that horn is made of. So pretty sad image here. Um, and this basically comes down to the, uh, the scale of the problem. And it's that rhinos are hunted extensively for their horns. Um, so in this picture, um, this is a, a friend and colleague of mine, um, Dr. Lynn McTavish. Um, and she sat there next to one of the rhinos on her preserve that had been cruelly poached um, and its horn um, hacked off um, and, and taken away. Um, to be sold on the black market. So for most African rhinos, particularly with white rhinos, um, the main cause of decline is illegal hunting, so poaching here. Um, it's not habitat loss. Um, it's not sort of um, the lack of opportunities to breed. It's simply that they're shot um, and then their horns are separated from them um, and then that's sold off um, to other markets. So. The reason for that is that horn is worth a lot of money. So potentially it sells for as much as 65,000 US dollars per kilogram. Um, so uh, it can be higher or lower than that, of course. But what that means is if you've got six kilograms of horn, that's worth a lot of money. Um, and there's a huge incentive to poach. So why is it poached? Well, historically, it was used a lot as daggers. Um, so dagger handles, um, and the, the jambia, uh, so that was in a lot of Arabian markets, places like um, Yemen. Uh, in more recent times, that's less common um, for a variety of sort of cultural and economic reasons. And now most rhino horn is consumed um, for traditional Chinese medicine. So this is something that's been done for perhaps 1800 years, the records go back, um, and it's basically prescribed for things like fever. So of course it's complete um, uh, nonsense, I suppose, in that sense, in that it is keratin. So um, there is no uh, medicinal benefit from eating it. It's no different from say consuming um, human nail or any other sort, sort of um, keratin protein. There's also some non-traditional uses. Um, and, and in more recent times, particularly in um, some Southeast Asian markets such as Vietnam, it's been um, sought after to cure things as uh, obscure as hangovers, um, cancer, a detoxicant, but also just as a signifier of wealth. So what I mean by that, a bit like something like caviar, people perhaps aren't necessarily consuming it because they like it, not really sure. Uh, it's just because it's worth a lot of money and it signifies, I have a lot of wealth, I'm important. Um, so it can sort of be given as a gift um, uh, in that sense there. So next up, I want to delve a little bit more into where these rhino populations are today in terms of numbers. So I'm going to start with the northern white. 
because uh, it's a pretty pretty sad um, story to tell. Um, so prior to European colonization, both the Northern and Southern white would have numbered in the hundreds of thousands. Um, today, as you can quite easily see uh, from that graph, that is no longer the case. So there are only two individuals of the Northern white subspecies left, um, and they are both female. So what that means is that it, the species is functionally extinct. Um, there is no opportunity through natural means um, for them to recover. Um, they will, without um, some significant uh, and potentially uh, impossible uh, interventions, um, remain that way. Uh, and in the next few years, they, they probably will go extinct. So you can see in terms of the population numbers, um, even as late as the, the 1980s, there was probably only about 15 to 30 left. Um, so it's been a long time happening um, with this subspecies, a long and gradual decline. So some of you might recognize this individual. Um, he was called Sudan. Um, he was the last male Northern white uh, and he died back in 2018. Um, so that was the last male that died leaving two female uh, rhinos. One is now post reproductive age. So no longer sort of, of breeding potential. Um, one's a little bit younger. So all hope is not lost because there are lots of clever um, potential routes um, to sort of try and bring them back. Um, and they all rely on assisted reproductive technologies. So before Sudan died, they froze his sperm. Um, and the last few captive northern white rhinos before they died, they also froze their sperm. In addition to that, they have a bank of um, oocytes of eggs taken from some of these females. Um, so they still extract eggs from the remaining female of breeding age now. So the long-term plan there is to take this genetic material, um, probably from about 10 individuals, so a very small population, to fertilize using in vitro technology, uh, those um, eggs with that sperm, and to implant it into a southern white rhino as a surrogate. So none of this has happened yet. They have proven that the embryos are viable um, and they have had some sort of division of cells. Whether that actually will work, um, and, and what that means for their future uh, still remains to be seen. Um, but even if it was possible, it would take decades to build up a population. And of course, um, they might struggle with sort of inbreeding effects and, and negative uh, recessive genetic disorders. Um, so all hope is not lost, um, but it will take a lot of money uh, and a lot of uh, scientific research to solve. So. Next up, gonna move on to a slightly more positive story, and that is the Southern White. So back in 1895, um, they'd been reduced to a single population of between 20 to 50 individuals. So um, they were in a very similar situation to what the Northern Whites were in only 50 years ago. However, they didn't continue down on the path to extinction. Um, it was completely turned around. Um, so uh, they were found in just a single um, hunting reserve. Um, so it was uh, in Shishlui and Falozi. Uh, it's an area in sort of uh, KwaZulu Natal in South Africa. Um, and they've been protected um, by sort of the Zulu King um, for several decades. And they were the only remaining population that was there. Um, so they were left for about two, three decades kind of just to themselves. And over that time, they increased to about 300 individuals. It's already sort of greatly increasing in numbers, um, but they were beginning to erode the, the carrying capacity of that site. So what that means is um, the resources in that park that they were found in couldn't support any more rhinos. So back in the 60s, a program of translocations was started. So rhinos were moved to new areas of habitat um, where they'd previously gone extinct. Um, and that was pioneered by a man called Dr. Ian Player. Um, so there's lots of really nice books on the subject, such as the White Rhino Saga or Operation Rhino that talk about how uh, they pioneered how to even capture rhinos, um, how you how you get a rhino to another site. Um, technology has come a long way from the sort of nets, um, hooks they used to use um, to sort of um, obviously anaesthetizing them, sort of darting them from helicopters as they do today. Um, so rhinos were slowly 
um, moved out to other populations. Um, they obviously moved some to zoos as well. So those modern zoo populations we have sort of came from these um, initial translocations in the 60s. And of course, there, some were moved to captivity um, as a sort of arc population in case what happened with the northern white also happened with the southern white. So it's now the most numerous of all rhino species. It probably accounts for what, about 75% of all rhinos alive today. Um, and it's internationally recognized as one of the greatest conservation stories of any large mammal. Um, so it really was turned around. It looked like all hope was lost. And it does give us some hope because if we look at the numbers of something like the Javan or Sumatra, uh, potentially in a hundred years, rather than them having gone extinct, um, we may have recovered them um, to these uh, larger populations. So um, things are or were looking quite positive for the southern white. Uh, they hugely increased in number through large scale interventions um, in terms of conservation initiatives. Um, but what you can also see on this chart towards the right is in recent years, that trend has reversed. So I'm gonna go into a little bit more detail on that in a second. So as I said, there was widespread population management. Um, there were very heavily managed species. Um, and a lot of it wasn't just transferring into sort of parks such as Kruger, um, but also to private reserves as well. So in Southern Africa, there's a lot of um, sort of commercial private management wildlife, um, and that can be for all kinds of reasons. So with the rhino, um, it actually started out as a lot of sort of managed trophy hunting and things like that. Um, then it moved on to a lot of more ecotourism and breeding. So essentially, um, rhinos had quite a high value. They were desirable for people to keep, um, and they were desirable um, essentially to sort of um, breed and increase. So as of 2017, almost 50% of rhinos are actually in private ownership in Southern Africa, um, rather uh, than in national parks. And that's quite similar actually for a lot of uh, wildlife species out there. Um, and the other nice thing about this um, is that much of this private land used to be used for cattle production. So um, it's essentially sort of been rewilded where we, um, uh, reserves in South Africa have sort of sprung from nowhere and brought back all of these different species. So now to focus on the current decline. So a combination of drought, there was a big, uh, huge drought in Southern Africa back in about 2015, coupled um, with the rise in poaching in that area again. So um, you can see here now on the right, um, as I've already alluded to, that we've gone from perhaps a high of about 21,000 individuals down sort of to about 18,000. Recent estimates are actually unclear. So that 18,000 was probably from population estimates about three years ago now. I'm still waiting for the latest data to come out. So that could have either dipped even further or recovered slightly. We simply don't know at the moment. But even, even so, it shows how quickly um, its fortunes can reverse. So um, next gonna show you a rather sort of upsetting image. Um, I think it's important though to sort of understand what's happening to rhinos. Um, so uh, do sort of steal yourself for the emotional impact of it. Um, this was a photo that actually won Wildlife Photographer of the Year a couple of years ago. Um, and I think it really emphasizes the sort of sadness of the situation, how these majestic animals essentially shot and have their um, horns ha hacked off with machetes, um, often when still alive still. It's, it really is quite a brutal, um, gruesome act. Um, and what recent data unfortunately shows is that um, poaching has very much increased over the last decade or so. So um, we can see in the data there, so this is seizure data um, from an organization called Traffic. And we can see about 1900 rhino horns uh, were seized between 2009 uh, and 2013. Uh, and then 2014 to 2018 that had uh, gone up over 50%. So there really is a sort of huge trend um, in terms of uh, poaching increase, I suppose. Um, it had certainly tailed off in, in Southern Africa, which is how these um, animals had increased in number. So for, for a few years, there were some populations that were poached, 
um, some that weren't, but broadly they were doing okay. Um, and in the last, um, what, since 2008, I suppose, um, poaching has really started to pick up again. So here is a chart showing uh, what has been happening year by year in both white and black rhino poaching mortalities in just South Africa. So this doesn't include other populations. It's just because South Africa's got sort of the best kept data here. And you can really see how in the early 2000s, things were looking really good for them. Uh, there was almost zero poaching. Uh, and it was only in 2008 um, that this suddenly started to almost exponentially increase. Um, and in recent years, things look like they have improved a bit. Um, but there's a few points to note on that. Um, one is that uh, lots of poaching mortalities don't get detected. So it's estimated that at least um, probably 20 or 30 percent additional rhinos are poached per year. But they're simply not found. Um, a park the size of Kruger, it's about the size of Wales, um, they simply don't monitor everything. And it's quite easy to, to not detect carcasses. Um, but it does show that over the last couple of years, it has gone to, uh, sort of down from this high in 2015. Um, but that's that's not from sort of no action. That's from a huge um, sort of increase in anti-poaching security. So NGOs, um, private owners, um, national parks have all had to chuck huge sums of money um, at this problem just to sort of hold the line. Um, and the problem is now it's sort of the, the low hanging fruit, so to speak, that have been poached. And it's only these rhinos that are found in these sort of heavily militarized areas um, that are left in this case. Um, and that poaching is still very much a problem um, and that the, the drivers of poaching are still there. It's just that we've got better, I guess, at tackling it. Um, the other point to make is with the last two years, um, it's likely that the COVID uh, 19 pandemic has prevented um, rhino horn from leaving the country. So, of course, lots of ports have been shut, lots of airports, um, travel has been restricted. So, it's probably been harder to get rhino horn from sort of source countries, so African countries, out to sort of Asian markets. And it's thought that that's probably also had an impact um, on these levels. So, um, the story here basically is that there's a lot of poaching. And it is at unsustainable levels, um, even when we're talking sort of in 300 individuals poached per year. Um, rhinos are a slow breeding species. Um, and even if you're sort of off taking just a few hundred, it's gonna probably tip them into a decline. Um, so, so very much still a huge issue. And there's my point on the carcasses going undetected. So next up, I'm going to focus on what actions are being taken against poaching um, and sort of how, how that fits in um, with modern sort of conservation practice. So I'm going to cover several things. First, I'm going to talk about field tactics. So what I mean by that is stuff happening in country with people on the ground, um, essentially trying to protect rhinos and stop them being poached. Um, and then going to talk about uh, policy and demand. So um, what, what sort of factors actually drive poaching um, and how, how can those be stopped? So the problem is, is that the cost of protection um, of rhinos, both black and white rhinos, has skyrocketed. So estimated security costs back in 2017 um, per reserve about $2,000, uh, which is a lot of money. That's about $24,000 or more per year. Um, if you're operating a business, you've got quite small margins. Um, you're perhaps not going to be able to pay that. Alternatively, if you're a national park and you're underfunded um, with not much government income coming in, that is a huge amount of your budget to account for. Um, and, and many reserves, um, it's in recent years, taken up to about 50% of their budgets so these rhino owners, of course, keep other species too. Um, and if they're spending all their money on protecting just one species, um, they can't focus on the management of those others either. To just sort of uh, make matters even worse, of course, most money in terms of national parks in Southern Africa, in terms of these private reserves is, of course, tourism driven. The last two years, 
that has dried up to almost zero. Um, even domestic tourism in South Africa was basically banned for at least six months, um, as we all know. Everywhere went into lockdown. The poaching didn't stop. Um, the management's um, costs didn't stop. Uh, they still have staff costs, all these things. Um, so it's caused a lot of issues in terms of um, paying um, for sort of anti-poaching security. In addition to that, there's also been the widespread disinvestment of rhinos. So as I said, a lot of rhinos are privately managed, um, but at some point they become more of a liability than an asset. So um, there's a saying that a rhino at the moment is worth far more dead than it is alive. Um, it endangers people's um, welfare, their lives, not just the sort of anti-security poaching force on the ground, but um, there's been plenty of cases where um, rhino owners have essentially been sort of held up um, and implicated in sort of security issues too. So um, what that means is quite obvious, obvious I guess, in terms of um, rhino population numbers. Um, it's going to greatly decrease sort of habitat. That's going to decrease carrying capacity, how many rhinos can be supported, um, and just sort of tie in with the, the, the gradual um, decline um, in how many rhinos that there are. So in terms of where most of that money has gone, it's of course gone where it's most needed, and that's on increased patrol effort. So most, if not all, reserves of rhinos on will employ some kind of sort of anti-poaching patrol. They have vehicles out every night, um, people on foot out every night, um, and they're there both as sort of a deterrence to stop poachers coming into those reserves, but also, of course, to catch them um, and actually apprehend them. Um, they're often supported by dog units, um, so there will be tracking dogs, but also dogs are used there as a sort of um, um, uh, a deterrence to um, you can uh, send a dog to run after a poacher, uh, tackle them to the ground, and then apprehend them, uh, which is a, a, obviously a much easier way and more ethical way uh, of shooting somebody. You can't just shoot somebody in South Africa because they're poaching. Um, it has to be, say, a threat um, to your life in that sense. Um, so they increasingly incorporate technological solutions into their tactics, um, things like acoustic monitoring. Um, that's quite a clever sort of way where they actually triangulate gunshots um, using speakers spaced around. Um, it was technology developed sort of inner city crime management that has been successfully deployed in some national parks. Aerial surveillance is of course things like drones, reconnaissance, um, simply seeing where both the rhinos are uh, and where people may be. Animal tracking is uh, sort of GPS tracking. You've got a collar on a rhino, you see when it doesn't move. If it's not moving, perhaps it's been poached. Um, it also allows you to sort of choose and plan where you should send those um, patrols as well. Um, other technologies such as thermal imaging to detect, say, um, poachers at night um, have also been deployed. Um, some of you might recognize um, uh, perhaps sort of the group on the right. Uh, you might have heard of the Black Mambas, that's an all female poaching or anti-poaching force, sorry, um, deployed in Kruger in South Africa. So not every area where uh, there are rhinos has the same poaching risk. Um, it depends on all kinds of things. Um, closeness to water, roads, access is a big issue. Um, if people can't get there, it could be, say, more or less poaching, because that could be both the uh, patrol force and the poachers who uh, uh, who need that access. Uh, the number of rhinos present is a pretty obvious one, but also things like topography. If it's quite steep terrain, um, that can either sort of help um, perhaps poachers or sort of hinder anti-poaching forces if they're using vehicles and things like that. Um, and so there's sort of two things you can do. You can uh, focus your um, patrols where those poaching hotspots are, or you can move the rhinos away from those poaching hotspots um, as an anti-poaching tactic. So when we're moving things away, we're talking about strategic translocations. So um, in a lot of areas heavily hit by poaching in uh, sort of Southern Africa, um, they've actually taken rhinos from um, certain hard hit reserves. So somewhere like Pinda in South Africa, has sent uh, about 87 rhinos um, to uh, the Botswana wilderness. So much lower population densities. Um, there was much po 
less poaching in these areas too. Um, and they're easier to protect because of that. Um, sadly, uh, it seems that in many cases, the poaching is essentially followed uh, to where those rhinos have gone. So despite the Botswana wilderness being a huge area, things like the Okavango Delta, after having zero years without any poaching, uh, there has been some poaching there too. Um, so it is still always a, an issue. You still always need security um, as well. Um, there's also some more local management of risk. So back when I was doing my rhino research um, on a reserve in South Africa, we were using drones to sort of um, fly around and look for poachers. Um, and we were also trying to move our rhinos away from quite at-risk hotspots. So in particular, um, when there was something like a full moon, um, we were quite worried about the rhinos. When there's a full moon, poachers can see the animals without needing a torch, so they can sneak around um, quite quite readily, uh, as well as being able to uh, sort of avoid signaling themselves to, to patrol units. Um, and uh, there's certain areas such as near fence lines that we didn't want the rhinos. So we were fighting a losing battle where um, in a sort of high risk uh, period, perhaps when we knew there might be uh, criminal syndicates in the area, we try and push these rhinos in sort of from the edge of the reserve to where they were to be better protected. Um, and what we noticed when we were flying these drones around is that the rhinos actually really didn't like them. Um, and we discovered um, that we could rather than say, try and chase them in on foot, which can be quite dangerous, we could push those rhinos um, away from that fence uh, by flying the drone towards them. Um, so it does sound quite mean. Uh, here's some footage of us doing just that. Um, but it, it was done for sort of a good cause. Um, and of course, this doesn't solve the poaching crisis. It was just sort of one, one tool in our arsenal uh, in terms of um, moving these rhinos um, away from at-risk areas. And there's no sound in this video, so don't worry if you can't hear anything. But it, it works quite well. They seem to have been reacting to sort of both the no mostly the noise of the drone. Um, it's quite a whiny buzz. So, hang on. It's not letting me skip. Let's get to the end. It's not watching any more YouTube videos. There we go. So, um, so just checking my timings. Excellent. So, very briefly, because I have spoken more than I hope to already, I'm going to power through some of um, my dehorning research from rhinos. So, I've not mentioned dehorning yet. Um, and what you can see on this um, large animal on the right is that it's had its horns trimmed. Um, so this is where it's done by veterinary procedure. So many reserves in Southern Africa are choosing to dehorn their rhinos because of these unsustainable security costs. So the idea is that it reduces poaching because there's less incentive for those poachers to go in and shoot that animal um, because there's not so much horn on it, but they've got the same chance of being caught. So it's this controlled removal of horn. Um, but we had some research questions, so it was being used as a, as a crisis response, but we were interested to know, of course, rhinos have got their horns for a reason. Um, what, what happens if you significantly shorten them? So we had several different um, things we were interested in testing, um, and I'm going to talk you through um, several of the things that we looked at to see, does dehorning actually work uh, as a, uh, in terms of the sort of animal's biology? Is it going to constrain them in some way? Um, so we weren't looking at its um, efficiency as an anti-poaching tactic. We were just interested to see if you're dehorning these animals to stop them being poached, how does that affect them? Because, of course, that would be important if it did have a negative effect on them. Uh, perhaps you'd want to focus your efforts on something else. So you've got to find the rhinos first, They're usually darted by helicopter. And like I said, I'm going to flip through some of these slides a faster now. Um, you then remove the horn. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, uh, it does regrow. So you need repeated trims, depending on that poaching risk, but perhaps every year or two. Um, it grows about 10 centimeters or a kilogram per year. Um, and you do that with a chainsaw. So the rhinos don't suffer. Um, it's no different sort of to trimming your nails, I suppose. Um, and they are anaesthetized throughout the whole process. So 
we're interested in several things. Um, a lot of sort of anecdotal, I guess, worry about what that could do to rhinos is that um, they might use their horns in some forms of resource access. So sort of either during foraging or um, other behaviors. So we had sort of quite a big behavior study. We set up a lot of camera traps where rhinos expressed some of these behaviors. Um, and what we found was that rhinos sort of um, dug in wallows, so they, they wallow in mud each uh, day usually, often using their horns to churn up that mud. Um, and we found that dehorned rhinos did this behavior exactly the same as horned rhinos. Um, they had sort of no uh, effect on those behaviors. Um, we also uh, had some sort of um, hypothesis that it might affect mineral consumption. Uh, black rhinos in particular have been seen rubbing their horns against sort of rocks or salt licks to eat grit. Can a dehorned rhino do that? Um, well, we found that yes, they could, um, and that they'd actually often just use their feet instead to sort of um, scrape or, or brush materials. Um, the last thing we actually looked at was some of the horn rubbing behaviors uh, to see if the frequency of these rubbing behaviors would change, um, sort of a comfort behavior like preening or something in birds. Um, and we found no change in that frequency either. So in terms of sort of resource access, we, we didn't detect any disruption, which is, a, which is a good thing. If it's going to be used, we don't want it to impact on rhinos. Um, the next thing we did is look at the physiology. So um, you can measure a stress response um, in vertebrate species by looking at um, various steroids, such as glucocorticoid st uh, steroids or uh, corticosteroid, um, as it's sometimes called. Um, one way you can detect that is in their feces. So you can see on the right, I've got a picture of some rhino dung and a picture of me with my arm up a rhino's bum. Because uh, sometimes that was the only way we could detect it. We had a very short window to get these samples. Um, and when you've got a darted rhino, because of how those um, steroid pathways work, uh, the sample you take then is actually from about 24 hours before that. So it allows you to get a sort of before and after indication of um, whether or not they're stressed. So we collected a bunch of samples to see what uh, they showed, and we didn't detect the chronic stress response. Um, so interestingly, that has been found in some other conservation procedures like translocation. But for whatever reason, um, either we missed it because our methods weren't good enough and we had reasonably small sample sizes, or it didn't really um, affect them in any great way. Um, so uh, long term, we didn't detect any rise uh, in these stress hormones. The other thing we looked at on a relatively minor scale is some aspects of social dominance. So, of course, rhinos fight, uh, they breed, they use their horns in social interactions. What happens if you significantly shorten those horns? Um, we only monitored in this case uh, a population of six uh, interacting subadults. So they weren't mature individuals. And we did actually detect an increase in agonistic behaviors. So that's um, sort of aggressive social behaviors, sort of charging, that sort of thing, um, after the dehorning procedure. However, what we found was that the dominant individuals um, within those groups, um, who was at the top of the hierarchy and who was at the bottom, didn't actually correlate with horn size or age. So it seems that there were sort of other social factors influencing what was going on here. Um, and it wasn't the case, at least in the subadult individuals, um, that horn size at least seemed to have a big impact on them. However, as I said, we only looked at the subadults. And of course, what really matters is what those breeding adults are doing. So we couldn't do that because we couldn't do everything. Um, we only had certain resources, but in this case, more research is certainly needed into social behavior in adults to see if it affects them in different ways or similar ways to some adults. Um, but what we can conclude is that the technique appears to compare favorably with some other forms of rhino management. Um, rhinos are still breeding, they're still fighting. All the behaviors that a horned rhino show, um, a dehorned rhino also shows. Um, so at least as a crisis response, um, it seems to be uh, okay, at least in terms of uh, the biology of the animals. Um, one of the other things that's not been investigated is whether or not it actually reduces poaching. There's not been any robust studies to see when you've dehorned a rhino, uh, and perhaps I didn't go into detail there, you still leave this stub, um, a bit like a nail. You can't go too deep when you're cutting it. 
or your damaged nerve endings. So rhinos do still have um, a stub of horn when they're initially um, uh, dehorned, and it only grows bigger over time. So what that means is that dehorned rhinos are still sometimes poached. So unfortunately, here's another uh, relatively morbid image of a poached rhino. Um, and these were two rhinos that I actually worked with. So in that social behavior study, um, that rhino at the back there, uh, they have names in this reserve, uh, she was called Rain. She was one of the rhinos that contributed to my behavior study. Um, and shortly after the study, they were poached anyway, even though they'd been dehorned. So uh, it potentially does reduce poaching, but it by no means is this magic solution to the problem. Um, so what that means is um, other solutions and other strategies are needed. So I'm gonna finish up very quickly over the next six minutes, I think I can finish by seven, um, talking about what some of those other strategies are. So we're talking about um, how to manage the causes of poaching here. You can manage it on the ground, but how can you actually stop it happening in the first place? So um, rhino horn, it's illegal to trade internationally. It's on the CITES uh, Appendix 1 Index, which prohibits all international trade. So all trade in rhino horn is on the black market and it's all illegal. So that's a starting point. Um, unfortunately, wildlife crime is often taken much less seriously than other forms of organized crime and convictions are often low. So one obvious thing is to increase um, sort of uh, conviction rates, um, increase um, law enforcement capacity, um, and basically prosecute these crimes to, to sort of act as a deterrent. However, much of conservation spending only really tackles the symptoms of poaching. So it's doing nothing, um, as I said, sort of earlier to, to prevent that demand in the first place. So that's another thing we can look at tackling. Um, how do we reduce people consuming rhinos or rhino horn? So as I said, it's, it's keratin based and it has led to some comparisons um, with human hair um, and fingernails too. So I'm just gonna show you a video. Let me just check I've got my sound settings working. Yeah, brilliant. So hopefully this will play. So there's been redu demand reduction schemes in various markets, um, fronted by people such as Jack Chan. So let's see if this works. If you're buying rhino horn, you may be paying for more than just horn. You're paying for guns, bullets, poison arrows, chainsaw, axes, and machetes to hack off the face of the rhino. And you are paying for the life of a beautiful creature. So please tell your friends and relatives, never buy products made from rhino horn. When the buying stops, the killing can too. So let's leave that there. Um, so great video there showing sort of the ways that we can get into these consumer markets and say, don't consume rhino horn, you're killing it good species, you're also adding to all these other problems as well. So that's one side of it, um, demand management, and something that's ongoing and trying to sort of reduce the scale of the problem. But that's not the only argument in some conservation circles. Um, and there are um, uh, some uh, sort of researchers, scientists, economists, who say that actually one way that we could um, prevent poaching is to actually legalize the trade. So in this case, um, we'd be talking about having a sustainable managed horn supply. So um, it's predicted that there's about, what, 10 tons of horn available per year, just from sort of natural mortalities. We've already talked about dehorning for conservation issues. Um, you're left with that horn anyway, trophy hunting, or just stockpiles from sort of years gone by or seizures. So um, one sort of counter argument to it is that actually rather than try and stop the trade, um, why not legalize it? Why not use that money generated um, to sort of fund rhino conservation? Um, but it's, it's actually quite polarized in sort of conservation circles over whether that's a good idea or not, um, whether it make the problem worse um, or whether it will solve it, perhaps. So there's been lots of economic studies um, putting a sort of estimate on what that could mean. 
Um, but one back in 2015 predicted that a sustainable legal foreign trade could generate profits of about $700 million per year. Um, so there's lots of assumptions in that estimate, of course, but the take home message there is that rhinos are underfunded. They rely on charitable donations and all sorts of things. Perhaps um, they could almost sort of pay for themselves in that sense. So um, and it's also been considered one of the potentially highest valued land uses to sort of um, almost game ranch or farm these animals. If you had rhinos in high densities, perhaps um, you could off take their horn, you could do it without injuring them um, and sell that um, to perhaps protect other more fragile populations. Um, and then the other thing that a lot of studies have, have made a strong uh, point on is that uh, a lot of issues with poaching uh, all come down to inequality, that the people who actually perhaps live next to the animals or who um, uh, live in the area where these animals are, uh, don't have any sort of rights to their management. And that if you had some sort of community project where they could um, benefit or, or make money, um, there would be less incentive um, for poaching to happen, more sort of community control to stop that. So that's an argument, um, but there's obviously lots of counter arguments to that too. Um, one issue is that if you legalized it, demand could hugely rock it. Um, you'd undo all of that good demand reduction campaigning um, and poaching could actually increase if it couldn't be met. Um, there's been some recent studies too, when I've cited at the bottom there saying, actually there's been consumers saying they prefer wild animals in that if you did manage it in sort of intensive operations, People might not want to consume that horn anyway. And then there's also the problem of if you've got a legal trade, how do you stop the illegal trade? It could be laundered onto the market. If the rhino horn was still valuable, um, then people perhaps could uh, target other populations and, and write that horn off as legally obtained. Um, so it's, it's an argument, but um, perhaps there are um, some valid counter arguments there too. Um, it depends on sort of, uh, what side of it you come down in terms of um, sustainable resource management, I guess there, or, or prohibition and what you think might work. So in summary, uh, rhinos have been actively conserved for over 120 years. Um, it's led to a dramatic increase in those populations. However, recent losses do threaten to push, these, uh, push this species back towards extinction. Um, and ultimately, the current poaching crisis cannot be solved alone by sort of field tactics, by in situ management of poaching risk. They need to incorporate other strategies that address the causes of poaching, whether that's reducing inequality and incentive to poach, whether that's reducing demand down to zero, or perhaps even incorporating some kind of um, sustainable horn harvesting strategy there. Um, but without tackling these sort of um, source and demand areas, poaching will continue to be an issue. So thanks for listening. I covered quite a lot there, so I'm sure you'll have several uh, questions. So anything you want to ask now, you can type in the chat or you can say, I've got a question, put your hand up and even unmute your microphone if you prefer. But thanks for listening. Um, if you do not want to stay for questions, you're of course welcome to leave now. Um, but we'll be hanging around for the next few minutes to, to chat about um, anything you might want to know. So anyone got any questions for me? Excellent. I will go to the chat first and then I see someone's got their hand up. Brilliant, so I'll start with one from Tim. Hi Tim, um, is there any evidence of dehorning affecting interspecific interactions? Brilliant, so um, do when obviously rhinos have these big horns, lots of animal species use their horns to protect themselves against predators and so forth. Um, and so if you reduce their weaponry, how does that affect populations? Um, there's been some studies of it, um, in fact, no, there haven't really. There's not really been any studies of it. There's been some anecdotal uh, points where rhino mortalities have not increased following dehorning due to natural causes. Um, it's actually really hard to measure because it happens so rarely that rhinos are predated. 
So it's only really rhino calves that are occasionally taken by sort of uh, lions or uh, spotted hyenas. Um, there's not even really that many records in the literature of that happening in the first place. So because rhinos are so large, because their calves are um, protected by adults most of the time, um, there's not that much data there. But you're right, it is a, it is a worry and it's something people have spoken about um, and asked. So um, I, I can't answer that question, but we, we don't really know. From anecdotally, there's not been any increases in rhino deaths from those that have been degaunt. That's all I can say. Um, Sasha, so you asked the question, to legalize it or not? So that, that is a good question. Um, and I often get asked this, um, and it, it's, it's a very sort of controversial question that causes a lot of uh, polarized views in the conservation community. And um, I've obviously got sort of opinions on it, um, but throughout my research, I had to be very, very clear that I wasn't some sort of chill for either side of the argument. All I care about is what's best for rhino conservation. And I didn't want people to sort of think that my research on dehorning, because of course there's an argument that dehorned rhinos ties in directly with the legal trade, um, would uh, mean that therefore I was suggesting that. Um, but I actually think that yes, it's something that needs to be considered. Um, I think the evidence for it though needs to be weighed up very carefully. I think we need more economic studies on whether it will work or not first. Um, and I think that the key thing is, is that there's local and community buy-in. So we couldn't simply just drop all restrictions today and have it worked. Um, it would have to be a, a highly regulated market. But I do think somewhat we do put rhinos up on the pedestal. I don't see why they can't be sustainably managed um, like other species. Um, perhaps it would make things worse. So it would certainly be, have to be something that if it did happen was under quite exacting circumstances. Um, and the issue is with a lot of these things, it would, it would be quite hard to monitor in practice. There's a lot of uh, corruption in many uh, of the areas these markets operate. Um, so I think in principle, yes, perhaps it's something that should be certainly looked at further and not ruled out. But um, the reality of it is, is still quite complex. So sorry to have a bit of a on the fence opinion there. Um, Brilliant. So I think that covers Virginia's point there. Which strategy do I prefer? I actually think you do a mix. Um, it doesn't mean that you can't have demand reduction simultaneously. Um, what else have we got? And sorry, I'm no longer looking at the camera. It's because I've got my chat um, inside. What I will actually do is unshare my screen. Excellent. That's better. Um, where were we? With the genetic differences, could South rhinos be translocated north? That's already happened. So if you go to Kenya, um, you'll notice that there are white rhinos on uh, reserves there in national parks um, in many cases. Those are not northern whites. They are actually translocated southern whites. So they do seem able to fill that ecosystem niche. Um, there don't seem to be any sort of um, dietary issues with that. Um, so white white southern white rhinos potentially could be sort of an analog for northern white rhinos even with those differences um there's some theories perhaps that they are less well adapted in some environments but because there's only two left there's there's no way of testing that um so and p uh, reports in the press of rhinos being born without horns as a reaction to, to dehorning it uh, seems like rather rapid evolution to me. Comments. I haven't actually seen those reports. Um, it wouldn't be to the dehorning, but absolutely, theoretically, it could happen, uh, perhaps on a longer term timescale. So I only know of this happening with elephants, where you've got this similar uh, problem. They're being killed for their tusks. Tusk, though, is, of course, a tooth. Um, it's enamel. Uh, it's ivory. Um, so. Uh, it's happened in elephants where heavily targeted uh, populations have been uh, led to them being sort of selected for elephants with smaller or even no horns. There's no reason why that couldn't happen in rhinos, but uh, it seems that the, the hunting pressure is so high, though, that even rhinos with small horns are getting poached. So I don't think that it's going to have any 
big impact anytime soon. Um, there was a question with a hand up. Was that asked in the chat? Anyone got anything else you'd like to add? Yeah, it was me actually. Oh, brilliant. And yeah, it was partially ahead. answered, but I just wondered, really, had anyone before you what the role of the, that sounds an obvious question, but what were they for? Um, I mean, not, you know, in, in terms of, you know, what, you know, they must have evolved for a reason. So I probably missed that, but what, what were that, what, what, what the relationship between size and, you know, population dynamics and anything else before you, you looked at the relationship when you dehorned them? Yep. Um, so, yeah, so rhinos, they, they use their horns in all kinds of social interactions. They use them when males meet one another, so they're territorial. Um, they fight um, to hold territories. Um, and then they also uh, sort of use them among populations in terms of sort of agonistic encounters. So certainly they use their horns um, and they are involved in um, sort of fighting. Um, and I think from... Um, some other so other, there has been some other research that's looked at sort of territorial displacement and things like that but no large-scale studies on, on what perhaps could happen um but it seems that dehorned rhinos still hold territories um and i think what it comes down to is as long as you're dehorning an entire population in a certain area and not leaving asymmetries in horn size no one rhino perhaps is um going to be uh advantaged over another they've still got horns um, they're just much smaller um, and at all stages in a rhino's life they have horns of different length because it's continuously growing um, so it's sort of within their natural um i guess capacity for want of a better word to have smaller horns but yeah you're right we need to have these studies on, on what would happen if you had half your rhinos dehorned and half not horns uh, would those horned rhinos then dominate how would that affect things? And are there longer term impacts if perhaps horns were having some signifier of health or um, strength? Um, would you then affect, uh, I guess, long, the long term genetics of that species? So there, there is a lot that isn't known that, that still needs to be known. Um, so, yeah, there's the obvious one from Sue D. I assume that's the Sue I know. Hi, Sue. Um, any evidence of female preference for males with large horns, um, as in other species? So you're right, that's a, a really common biological thing to observe. Um, it doesn't, to our knowledge, seem to apply um, to white rhinos in terms of female selection. So the reason for that is that uh, males are territorial, they fight other males for those territories, and then females breed with those males that they're in the territory with. And it seems that they have no preference on which that in individual is. Their home ranges overlap with multiple territories. It seems to be whenever they come into estrus, they breed with that rhino that that's in that territory. So they're selecting their partners based on their ability to hold the territory rather than on their um, physical trait. But of course, it could be that the horns themselves dictate which rhinos are holding these territories so it, it could could affect it uh question from mark um what conservation strategies might be more promising for the rhino species with very small populations um so i suppose in this sense um we're talking about the asian species the sumatran and the Javan rhino populations um, dehorning certainly is not something that's even been considered for those species. There's too few of them, um, don't want to have any sort of impacts on them. That's all about just protecting them in terms of increasing security. But the problem with these rhino populations, the Sumatran and the Javan populations, is they're so few um, that what they really need is increased habitat. So there's been talk for years to separate the Java rhinos away from this one national park in West Java, away from Krakatoa, and have this insurance population. It needs to happen, but it hasn't happened yet. With the Sumatran rhino, it's almost the opposite problem in that there's really small fragmented populations. Um, they actually need to be brought together to allow for breeding, um, to stop this um, Ali effect of individuals not meeting. Um, and 
unfortunately, um, I think it's been difficult to coordinate the Malaysian and Indonesian governments to work together to bring those rhinos into essentially semi-captivity um, in managed populations, because that's the only way um, they're going to increase now by putting them all together in one population. Um, there's actually subspecies of Sumatran rhino. It's too late to kind of worry about that. I think the answer is just to mix them all together and increase them as much as you can. Um, brilliant. So hopefully just one more question and then you'll all be welcome to go away for your evenings. Feel free to ask others. No, I'm not going anywhere. Um, Chloe, so you saw a paper about replica horns made of horse hair. Um, so can it be made to look and feel similar to the horns? Could it counter or encourage the legalizing rhino horn argument for poaching? Um, so yeah, we're talking about fake horns um, and how they could be used in terms of the market. So yeah, um, I guess theoretically you could flood the market with fake horn, um, but the problem is things like Chinese medicine are based on, um, I guess, sort of cultural or even sort of mythical, uh, for want of a better word, uh, traits of that species. Um, and the fake horns that perhaps are not made of rhino won't have that. So if there is some way to tell um, or um, some ability to still obtain real horn, people would do that. So I think it would be a struggle. Uh, and the problem with it would be, you then might, of course, increase sort of demand in the meantime before you had um, a sustainable supply there. So perhaps again, one thing that could be used in tandem with others, but I think as a long-term solution, it, it wouldn't work just from, from what people actually want. So I didn't really talk about rhinos in captivity um, and it is an important part of the puzzle. So, um, as I said, for things like the Sumatran rhino, um, there were there is talk uh, and plans to actually bring them all into captivity to breed or semi captivity sort of um, in in countries still. Um, that the, the reason that that's actually uh, not happened yet is it was tried before and it didn't work, and those Sumatran rhinos died in captivity. So much more is now known about managing rhinos in captivity that they can actually breed really well um, and it can actually work both as say an insurance population or as a way to sort of mix the gene pool um, and there's also been cases where rhino reintroductions in terms of both black and white rhinos have had source populations in zoos so it absolutely is important um, important to have these species sort of in different areas as long as there's a uh, mixing of the gene pool, that's the most important thing, that there is a stud book, that there is an inbreeding. Um, I think um, ca captive populations, uh, again, can be quite important in terms of um, having this insurance population. And in fact, those northern white rhinos, those last three, are all ex-captive rhinos. So the only ones left were kept in this Czech zoo uh, and San Diego zoo, I believe. Um, they brought those northern whites together in Kenya after they'd been in zoos for decades to try and sort of help them breed, but it was sort of too little too late there. Um, but the, cap the, the challenges in captivity um, are less big than they used to be. Um, uh, quite a lot is known about reproduction can, can help these days in terms of making them reproduce. Excellent. Well, we've seen to have come to a nice conclusion there. Um, I won't keep anybody any longer because an hour and a quarter is a uh, long time to sit and listen, but hopefully you found that interesting. Um, it is on YouTube. Again, someone said they turned up late. Um, feel free to share that people. So it's not on YouTube yet. It will be downloaded. It will be processed. It will be uploaded to YouTube. But if you check back on our website at some point, uh, you will be able to access that. Brilliant, so thanks to everybody. I'm gonna end the live stream Facebook now. Sorry if anyone was asking questions on Facebook, I didn't manage to access that to see them. Um, let's see if I can quickly see that now. Oh, God, I'm playing myself, it's not good. Uh, so apologies if you were on Facebook and you didn't manage to get your question answered.
Brilliant. Looks like we're mostly good. Uh, is there, if Raven, if you're still there, 12 minutes ago, uh, evidence of efforts to reduce demand, are they working? Uh, in some areas, absolutely, yes. There are some markets uh, where rhino horn consumption has gone down. Uh, Japan used to be a market, no longer is. Perhaps there were other factors in there too. Um, but there are markets that have increased despite demand, re uh, demand reduction schemes, uh, such as Vietnam, which has really increased in consumption. So um, I think, though, that is all the questions, including on Facebook there. Excellent. Thanks very much. I will now end the chat talk. See everyone next month, hopefully. Bye, everyone.